Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you today? Great. Okay. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm very excited, you know, to have with us this morning uh, Dr. Teresa Kidd, uh, who is here to kick off our uh, fall 2013 season of our Breakfast with the Expert program. And uh, Dr. Kidd uh, is uh, Senior Vice President uh, of Operations uh, with Frontier Health. Many of you may be familiar with Frontier Health. Uh, this is the leading uh, health care organization providing behavioral and related health care services uh, in our region, in uh, Northeast Tennessee and in Southwest Virginia. Uh, Frontier Health operates 64 different locations across 12 counties, serving some of the most disadvantaged populations in our region. Uh, this is a very you know, important uh, dimension of our healthcare system. We really have not had the opportunity to address behavioral health services as part of Breakfast with the Expert before, so it's exciting you know, to be uh, covering you know, this important uh, area today. And who better you know, than Dr. Kidd uh, to uh, share with us her work in this area and how we can uh, continue to assure access to quality behavioral health services in our region. So I thank Dr. Kidd for being with us today and uh, I will let her um, start you know, her presentation and I'm sure she will be happy to uh, address your questions and, and comments uh, this morning as well. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Here. Thanks. When I walked in the building this morning and I looked at all the experts who've been here um, to present to you all, I, I felt a little bit like maybe I didn't quite belong. Uh, there was quite, a, quite an array of folks, and I thought, wow, I'm in really good company. Uh, I felt a little bit out of my element until I saw the saying on the wall that says that, um, what it, it says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And then I felt at home, um, because it is. Uh, mental health certainly plays a role in, in a person's overall health status. And um, let me tell you just a little bit about, about Frontier. Uh, Frontier Health is a not-for-profit organization that provides a variety of behavioral health services and we're going to get into a little bit about what those services are. Um, we do provide services across the region, uh, so we cover all eight counties in Northeast Tennessee, plus we have four counties in Southwest Virginia. I started with the Mental Health Center in 1982, so I've been around for a little while. Um, and when I first started, it was not called Frontier Health. Um, and part of our history, I think, um, is important to know, to understand how we've been able to accomplish uh, being able to assure access to high quality behavioral health services in our region. Um, I used to, uh, used to work with an organization called the Nolichucky Holston Area Mental Health Center. And that provided coverage service area uh, for Green Hawkins and Hancock County. There was Watauga Behavioral Health Services, which was the Johnson City, Carter County, Washington County, Carter County, and Unicoi County. There was Bristol Regional Counseling Center, which encompassed um, parts of Sullivan County, the Bristol area of Sullivan County, and Johnson County. And then there was um, Holston Counseling Services, which was Kingsport um, and some of the other areas around in there. So we had, between the four of us, we had the region covered, and then Holston also provided services through a contract with Planning District 1 in Southwest Virginia for Virginia. And that relationship continues today. Um, the four uh, executive directors of the mental health organizations were very collaborative. They were very friendly, they worked together, they had projects going on together in the region, and um, like most professionals, they sought out colleagues that could help them troubleshoot and problem solve. So they had been together for a long time. And in the, I believe in the seven, in the early 80s, I believe it was, uh, and may get my dates a little bit mixed up here, but Holston and Bristol merged and brought in the Alcohol and Drug Council in Kingsport. And um, so they formed a merger uh, which was known as um, Central Appalachian Services. And they provided services to all of the Sullivan County area, Southwest Virginia, and um, 
in Johnson County. And that's kind of the start of when we started getting a pretty heavy emphasis on providing substance abuse services as well with the, the, the pulling in of the um, Alcohol and Drug Council and Dr. Jesse's expertise. And then in, um, when all this, the talk, some of you may have been around when the state started talking about moving to managed Medicaid uh, and moving to 10 care in the, in the 90s. And um, at that point, the executive director started talking even more about was there a possibility for us to do a full merger to help develop a more comprehensive array of services that would be more easily accessible to the people in the region? Could we look at the strengths of each organization and come together, decrease our administrative costs? Why did it make sense if we were coming into this, this uh, uh, venue of managed care for all three organizations to have full administrative services, a full HR department, full computer department, would it not make more sense to combine our energies and combine our efforts, reduce our overall administrative costs within the region, and develop this array of services um, to kind of deal with managed care? So there were a lot of meetings. Uh, I think in 96 is when TenCare first came in for the primary health care for the physical health care part but all along there was talk that in a year the behavioral health component would come under managed care under 10 care so we spent most of 96 in meetings together talking about if we merged what it would look like who would do what how would we manage this beast we had three organizations all of us felt like we were the best we all felt like we had the best policies and procedures and of course you know the, the truth of the matter is every organization had its strengths and every organization has things that that they didn't want to bring to the table. And in 1997, May 1st of 1997, we announced our merger. And at the time, uh, it was decided that Doug Varney would be our executive director. He had been the executive director of uh, the Kingsport, the whole the CAS location. And I think Doug, having been through a merger before, he had also merged with Bristol along the way. Um, I, I talked about that. And then with the A&D Council, he learned that in the, these kinds of mergers, the best thing to do was not lay anybody off. Everybody had a job. It was just finding the right job for the right person. And what he found was a, a lot of times along the way, people who were thinking about retiring said, I just, I don't want to deal with this. I'm just going to go ahead and retire now. People shifted around and it would right size. We started out with a very large administrative cost, but inside of two years, we were back down to about a 13% administrative cost, which is really where you want to be. So um, the other thing that brought us together, I think, during that, that year was um, um, Watauga owned um, Woodridge Hospital. I don't know if you all know that, but Woodridge Hospital was owned by Watauga at the time, Watauga Behavioral Health, and they were Joint Commission accredited, and none of the rest of us were. So we merged during the Joint Commission year where we were going to have our survey. And those of you who have ever heard about these kinds of surveys, um, they're, they're very in-depth, they're very onerous. We had nine surveyors for a week, uh, and all the rest of us had to learn the Joint Commission standards and learn how to apply that to our outpatient sites. So we did, and that kind of brought us together, and uh, we've been more or less living happily ever after since 1997. But that's how we came to be Frontier Health. We no longer have the hospital. We did have this full continuum of services, but because of uh, the Institutes for Mental Disorders waiver that the state had, uh, inpatient psychiatric hospitals had to be owned by an acute care facility or be less than... than um, 16 beds. And we had a 75 bed psychiatric hospital in the region. We made the decision that it was better for the region to keep it as a 75 bed psychiatric hospital than to reduce it to 16 beds and own it. So we put it out for bids between uh, the, the Wellmont system and the Mountain States system. Mountain States won the bid and the only, our only caveat was that they, they had to be committed to running that facility as a psychiatric facility for a minimum of four years post sale. So we kept the hospital in the region, which was really important for the people in our region. We no longer owned it, um, which you know, was, was both good and bad. We kind of missed having that continuum. But, but so many of the people at Woodridge stayed who had been our employees. We maintained that relationship and that collaboration so that we work very closely together to kind of make sure that our folks can access the hospital and their folks, once they're in the hospital, can access outpatient services. So that's a little bit of history about our agency. Here's our service area. 
Um, you can see we've got the, the eight counties of Northeast Tennessee, and again, through our contract with Planning District 1, we have Lee Scott and Wise counties, the city of Norton, and we also have a contract with Highlands Community Service Board to provide some services in Bristol, Virginia. Our mission is to provide quality services that encourage people to achieve their full potential. As I said, we're a 501c3 uh, not-for-profit corporation, and we do have a 14-member uh, board of directors. That's a voluntary board of directors. Our vision, if you think about what our topic is today, and you think about what our, what our vision is, it really meshes really well with, with what, what we're talking about today. So our vision is to be a leader in establishing and demonstrating local, regional, and national standards of excellence for accessibility, for high quality behavioral health care, intellectual dis developmental disabilities and vocational services. Unlike a lot of uh, mental health centers, we're not just mental health, we do substance abuse, we do developmental disability services, and we provide uh, vocational services as well. Here's some of the values that drive our organization that help us um, to stay true to our mission and vision. We do believe that people come first, First and foremost, the people we serve, and then our employee base, and that they're treated with dignity and respect, and that we encourage them to achieve their full potential. Employees are recognized as our greatest asset. If we didn't have a good employee base, we really couldn't do much of anything for the people in our region. Service excellence is our foundation for the quality of care. Healthier communities are supported through partnerships and educational programs to promote improvements in the overall quality of life. And excellence and efficiency are achieved through integrity, teamwork, leadership, creativity, continuous improvement, and a strong work ethic. One of the reasons that I'm here today is that um, our agency reached out um, to, to this college because we saw a grant opportunity that really needed a strong partner. And I said, let's, let's see about working with the, with the school, the College of Public Health, because I think that um, we could be good partners. There look like there's some opportunities there for us. As it turns out, the grant opportunity, that grant opportunity, wasn't one we decided to go for. But, but in the meantime, a bunch of us sat in the room together and decided that we really shared very common missions um, and very common values and uh, had this, this service orientation to the community. And I think we're going to continue to look for ways to, uh, to partner together. What drives Frontier Health and what helps to develop this array of services for the people that we serve and to keep us focused on excellence are our key success factors. And everything we do has to fall into one of these key success factors. Um, so you see the quality performance and service, recruitment, development, retention of quality staff, staying research and clinically and focused on clinical developments. We don't do a lot of research, but we stay apprised of what's out there and what's new and what we need to be doing. Remaining community focused while fostering strategic coalitions. That was really key for us. Remember I told you we started out as four small community mental health centers that were really de dedicated to certain communities. And then we became quite big. We have an employee base of about a thousand employees. We're spread out all over the place. And one of the things that we knew we had to do early on to, to be successful is to remain community focused. So we can be this big frontier health, but we have Nolichucky Mental Health Center, a division of Frontier Health. We have Watauga Mental Health Center, a division of Frontier Health. We retained all of our community names. Fostering um, strategic coalitions, I talked about fiscal accountability and performance. Um, yes, we're service oriented and yes, we're not for profit, but if we can't pay the bills, we won't stay around for very long. So we have to make sure that our programs, at least some of our programs, have a little bit of a positive line because we have some programs that will never break even. Um, they just won't. They're grant based and the grants don't increase and they'll never ever make any money. So we have other programs that can carry some of those. One of the things that, that Dr. Wyckoff and Dr. Curry asked me when we met um, at Frontier Health uh, last month was, how have you been able to do this? And we had most of the vice presidents in the room and we all just kind of stared at them uh, with no answer. And we're, we just, well, it's just what we do. I mean, you know, but then when you look at it, this is how we've been able to do it, staying true to our mission, staying true to our values, and staying focused on the things that will help us provide good services to the folks in our area. 
So we talked about that. We do have 64 locations. Those locations are comprised of outpatient mental health services, residential treatment services, and we have a variety of group homes for individuals who are mentally ill. We have group homes for those individuals who are developmentally disabled and can't live on their own. We have a host of apartments that we manage and operate for folks who are able to move out of the group home and live more independently. We have sheltered workshops. So there's, they're not just outpatient mental health centers. There's a whole host of locations in there. During last fiscal year, which just ended uh, for us in, at the end of June, we impacted 51,131 lives in our region. And this gives you a little bit of a snapshot about the kinds of services we offered and the numbers of people who access those services. So you see, obviously, our, our largest array of services are our clinical services. So we had um, 30,000 people who accessed one of our behavioral health services um, in terms of our outpatient services residential programs. And then uh, we also offer in our children's services, I didn't mention this, through contracts with the Department of Children's Services, we offer therapeutic foster care and adoption services for kids in state custody. So you kind of see the numbers of people um, who access our services. Sometimes people talk a lot about the stigma of mental health, how people don't really want to get services because they're stigmatized by their diagnosis. We're not seeing too many barriers to people getting help, but it does still exist. It, it, we, we know that we, there are more folks out there, particularly children and adolescents who could be served. Uh, we are licensed and accredited. Um, we switched from joint commission when we sold the hospital to CARF accreditation. CARF is the uh, Commission on Accreditation for Rehabilitation Facilities. It's much more outpatient based, uh, very recovery oriented and fit much better for us than a, than a hospital joint commission um, did. So we have, um, of course we're licensed by the Departmental Health and Substance Abuse. Um, and in recent years, and you probably have seen this uh, through your public health orientation, you know our region is, um, is really struggling with prescription drug abuse and drug abuse in general. We provide a lot of substance abuse services and the department really encouraged its contractors to not just be substance abuse service uh, or, uh, oriented, but to be co-occurring oriented where we have a lot of folks who have both the presence of a mental health and a substance abuse disorder. And the treatment that you provide for an individual who's co-occurring is a little bit different than the treatment you provide for an individual who just has a substance abuse or who just has a mental health disorder. So it's really important for people to be cross-trained and understand how those two interact with each other and create a whole different set of needs. So we are co-occurring disorders treatment enhanced. We received that rating about four years ago and have maintained it. Um, the Department of Intellectual and Disabilities, uh, Developmental Disabilities, we received a four-star rating for three consecutive um, uh, uh, audits, uh, and that four-star rating simply means that we're promoting independence and recovery as best we can and following uh, the standards um, uh, to the best possible degree. Again, we're licensed by the Department of Children's Services. Um, you all know about HIPAA? Anybody ever heard about HIPAA? Gold star for anybody who can tell me what it means without it being, you know, the professors who are in here. Anybody know what it stands for? Anybody want to stat take a guess? Well, that's what it refers to. Um, HIPAA started out as something very, very different than it's turned into now. But HIPAA had, I'm not going to, I could do a whole thing on HIPAA because I'm also the privacy officer for our organization. But HIPAA has a whole host of privacy standards and a whole host of security standards as we've gone into the into the arena of, of electronic records, electronic medical records. Security has become a huge thing in HIPAA right now. But um, apparently uh, the Office of Civil Rights that oversees HIPAA had decided that they weren't doing a good enough job with auditing and monitoring covered entities to see if they were being in compliance. So so in 2012, they decided to contract, they put out a contract for an organization to do these audits and uh, there were like 177 standards that entities had to, had to meet successfully um, or there would be some significant fines if, they're, if they weren't in compliance. And nationwide, they did a random audit of 115 
covered entities, which would be hospitals, doctor's offices, dentist's offices, mental health centers, um, health care plans, or health care clearing houses. Just 115. So I sat around the table with our HIPAA committee going, we need to be ready for this just in case. And eyes were rolling. Oh, for God's sakes, Terry, they're only choosing 115. They'll never choose us. Well. We were randomly selected as one of the 115 nationwide entities to be audited. Um, it was probably one of the few times I really wanted to close my door and just cry. But, you know, it's just not very becoming to do that when you're the Senior Vice President of Operations. So you gather yourself together and you look at what you got and you get ready for it. And uh, we had no findings in our audit. Uh, it was really a good exercise for us. Um, and we do now believe in, in random audits and being selected. But um, that, was, that was big for us. So CARF accreditation, uh, we have uh, contracts with the Office of Criminal Justice Programs, some of our newest programs that again focus on the community influence that we have and the collaborations that we have. We have some programs called uh, Community Justice Liaisons where we actually have staff who are located in the detention centers and in the courts working on diversion programs for those people who come through with, uh, who may have mental illnesses or, or substance abuse charges to see if we can get them in programs that will um, move towards recovery and rehabilitation rather than incarceration. So we work very closely with the, with the jails uh, and the sheriff's departments. Uh, Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, Substance Abuse, Social Services. Uh, because we're in both states, we have to be licensed by both state entities. Here's our employee base. We have 22 either physicians or advanced registered nurse practitioners. We've gotten a little bit heavier on um, advanced nurse practitioners in recent years. It's really very difficult to recruit psychiatrists to this area. Um, psychiatrists are probably in great demand, while well, they are in great demand nationwide. So we've had some difficulty with recruiting. So we've kind of changed our model to use the physicians we have more as um, they do provide direct services, but they're kind of, they take the hardest, the, the most difficult cases, and then they're also training these nurse practitioners and working with them. So we've been really fortunate to be here so close to ETSU and to UT because we get students from all over and we have a lot of nurse practitioners um, uh, from the area who are working with us. And then if we can keep them here before they go to the VA, at least for for three to five years, we, we feel like we've been successful. Um, 66 official office and, and office managers and officials. We have uh, 421 professional staff, and in there are our nurses, our case managers, and our therapists. Uh, our case managers are bachelor's degree staff who have a human service related um, degree, uh, who work more in the community directly with, with folks. Um, and then we have therapists. We do hire therapists who are not li yet licensed. They work under the supervision of a licensed therapist and our expectation is that they be on a licensure track and within two to three years to go ahead and get the highest level of licensure that they can have. So in that therapist space we have a, a nice interdisciplinary we have a couple of psychologists we're not very heavy on the PhDs we're more heavy on the master's level staff uh, licensed clinical social workers licensed professional counselors uh, licensed marriage and family therapists and um, some licensed alcohol and drug counselors. In our residential services and in our uh, MIS department, we have about 255 techs. Uh, and then we have a variety of office clerical maintenance and housekeeping staff. If y'all have questions as we go, please feel free to interrupt me if anything. There's our services. Um, some of our services, most of our services, I'm not going to read down through all of them, but I'm just going to let you take a look at them. Um, one of the things that's really important for individuals who have um, mental health problems is that we can treat their mental health disorder with therapies, with medications, but, but where their recovery really fits in, it's really difficult to have full recovery if you don't have a good place to live and if you um, don't have a job. A lot of these folks really can work, they want to work, so we find that making sure that we find them a safe place to live and trying to train them to their maximum uh, abilities really helps with their success and helps with their recovery. Okay. Yes? What is your primary source of reimbursement? 
Okay, it's a great, it's a great question. Uh, one of the things that we've been able to do and hopefully we'll be able to continue to do is maintain a um, real diversity in our funding streams. So we have a lot of contracts with these different departments, Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, Department of Children's Services, Department of Criminal Justice, uh, Department of Health. We, we have contracts with those departments. And then about 34% of our revenue, um, which is probably the biggest bulk, but people are surprised that it's only 34% comes from TenCare. Um, so, uh, or Medicaid, uh, because we take Virginia Medicaid as well. And then we have um, private insurance clients. We don't just see indigent clients. We have private insurance clients as well. So we, we try, that's why it's so important to get licensed staff, because private insurance is, you have to be licensed and then be paneled in order to, to receive reimbursement from um, insurance companies. So um, we, we get private insurance, we take Medicare. Um, we take, uh, we, we are a safety net provider for the state. Y'all probably know about safety net providers because your health departments, I believe, are, are safety net providers for the, for the primary health. We're safety net providers for behavioral health, which is people who have no funding source, who are income eligible, and who have a, a, a significant mental health disorder. We can apply for and help them get safety net funding to pay for their mental health services. Um, and then we take people who have no, no revenue. Um, because we've been able to uh, blend our financial resources pretty well, we are still able to offer services on a sliding fee basis. We're a recipient of United Way funds, and most of the funds we get from United Way help us offset the cost of delivering services on a sliding fee basis. So nobody is ever turned away for their inability to pay. I got it? Okay. Y'all know about our crisis stabilization unit? Have you heard about that service? You all know that Commissioner Varney, who used to be our executive director and in 2011 was offered the position of commissioner of the Department of Mental Health, um, which was probably the one last thing he wanted to do in his career before he, before he, he went, went away. Um, he's been down in Nashville since 2011 as the commissioner. And when the governor wanted to, uh, wanted all the departments to cut their budgets, uh, Commissioner Varney said, what I'd like to do is close Lakeshore because of the cost it, it takes to operate Lakeshore and the numbers of people who are there. The facility was built to, to house hundreds, and it had only been averaging about 50 people. And uh, what he found was that most of the people who went to Lakeshore were short term, and they could easily be served in their communities if the funding could be freed up from the institution back into the communities. It cost about $950 a day to put somebody in Lakeshore for a day, cost about 450 to put them in a private psychiatric hospital. So what he did was close Lakeshore, and he um, provided reimbursement to to uh, Peninsula in Knoxville, um, to Woodridge, to Mountain States up here in Woodridge to pay for indigent beds. Um, he provided resources to Cherokee Mental Health Services in um, Hamlin County, to us, and to Helen Ross McDab in Knoxville to open up crisis stabilization units, which could have people who were in psychiatric crisis but not quite committable to go for up to three days to get stabilized. It's almost operates. I won't. It almost operates as a mini hospital unit doctors, nurses 24-7, but people come in, get stabilized, get hooked into outpatient services and discharged. And then he put some resources into developing some very specialized, more high-level intensive group homes, both with McNabb and with us. Um, and we have one, we have two of those homes. But our crisis stabilization unit is here in Johnson City. And we work, again, very closely with um, with Woodridge, if they have a, a person that they don't feel is admittable but doesn't need just outpatient, then we'll take those individuals. Questions about the service array? Okay, our client care departments, outpatient services. We do prevention and early intervention. We have a lot of school-based services. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways that you assure access to high-quality behavioral health care is to not just sit in your office and expect people to come to you. 
Um, you have to get out there. So we have school-based services in most of the schools, um, not every school, but in most of the school systems in our region. Um, and those folks are doing a variety of things from prevention and education to therapists, licensed therapists who are in the schools doing intervention services. Um, we have a child abuse prevention grant uh, that we operate in the communities. Uh, we do, we have a forensic and assessment unit, uh, both in Kingsport and in Johnson City that does psychological evaluations. And we do forensic competency and insanity evaluations for the courts. Uh, outpatient therapy for both mental health and substance abuse. We do intensive in-home services, uh, case management coordination, uh, both in mental health, substance abuse, and developmental disabilities. We have some intensive outpatient services for substance abuse in Bristol, in Johnson City, and in Kingsport. And we're getting ready to open one in Hawkins County. And then we provide, of course, medication services through our psychiatrists and our nurse practitioners. We have a 24-7 crisis continuum. Um, I, I hope you're seeing this in the back of your mind. Keep the title of my presentation in the back of your head. This is how we assure access. Um, the high quality part is, is up to us to make sure we get proper training, but this is all about access. We have mobile crisis response, uh, crisis stabilization. Our calm center is kind of a respite center for people who are feeling um, very vulnerable, they don't really want to be home by themselves, they can come and we have a, a 23 hour respite place where they can come with staff and then we can assess them to determine if they, what they need and, and where they need to go from there. We do offer some degree of uh, diversionary transportation to get folks either to the, the crisis stabilization unit or to Woodridge. We have a short, short stay respite, uh, evaluation triage referral, and then we've got the walk-in center. Our substance abuse detox and treatment center is Magnolia Ridge. Um, and then we also have Willow Ridge, which is just uh, for females. And it's a step down program from the detox center. It's more residential. But here are the services that we offer at Magnolia Ridge, Magnolia Ridge and Willow Ridge. Magnolia Ridge and, and Willow Ridge. And those are, those are the facilities. They're both here in Johnson City. Um, one of the, the several of the physicians that we have who work this unit as well as the CSU are um, uh, double boarded in internal medicine and in psychiatry, which is really helpful because these people come in very medically vulnerable, uh, as you might imagine, detoxing from um, opiates and other substances. Our vocational services, uh, we have employment services. We do on-site employment at our shelter workshops, uh, Frontier Industries Bristol and Kingsport. We do skills training, work adjustment training, job skills training, and enclaves. We also send people out into the communities and provide job coaches to help them be successful in jobs that are jobs, not just jobs that we have internally, but jobs that are out there in the community for them. We do both supported and competitive employment, job placement, um, assessments, and then we do follow along. Here are therapeutic foster care services. We refer to them as out of home treatment. Traces is our Tennessee version and values is our Virginia version. You may have seen our traces signs around because we're always recruiting for foster parents. Um, this is, um, we, we generally do about seven to ten adoptions a year of the kids that we serve uh, and we, we have about we used to have about 54 foster parents in the region and that has dwindled now to probably closer to, to 40 because the good news is those parents became adoptive parents for the kids whose who's, um, whose parents lost their rights. So that was good for the children not so good for us but but very good for the kids. Um, so that we also have group home care. Uh, these are our, our three group homes, Sullivan House on the bottom, uh, Link House and Sullivan House is in Bluff City, uh, Link House is in Kingsport, and uh, Crossing Point is in, I'm sorry, Sullivan House of Bluntville, Crossing Point is in Bluff City. So it's males, females, males. And actually, Sullivan House is a little bit different. The other two are contracted. Uh, we do placements under contract with the Department of Children's Services. Sullivan House is a very unique um, 
across the state. I'm really not aware of any other uh, organization that does this. The local government of Sullivan County um, contracts with us to operate that, that site specifically for the three juvenile court judges in Sullivan County so that they can place directly there for kids who look like they might be going into state custody, but it's kind of their last shot effort. So public responsibility and citizenship, uh, that should ring a chord for you all. Uh, that's not an uncommon um, concept for you, I know. There's our executive team. And uh, other than our medical director, our VP of Virginia Services, um, most of us on this chart have been with the organization or one of its precursor organizations for 30 plus years. Um, so one of the things that gives our organization um, that, that uh, stability is the, long, the longevity of its employees. One of the other things that gives it its energy is that we are constantly getting in new graduates into our program and they bring energy and ideas um, and youth, which we're growing short of on this organizational chart. Um, we meet weekly and you know do like what most executive teams do. Um, performance improvement is big for us. We're always looking at, we've got this huge array of services. We have almost a thousand employees. We serve over 53,000 people a year. And on any given day, something's not going right somewhere. That's just how it is. Um, we've been very fortunate to not have um, a lot of, of, um, of incidents, a lot of negative incidents, but somebody's not happy with us someplace every day. And so, you know, our job is to make sure that the people who are not happy get hooked up with someone who can help them fix that problem and so we can get them what they need and move on. And sometimes we can't fix their problem. Sometimes their problem is this doctor won't give me this drug. And that doctor is not going to give them that drug, and there may be a very good reason for it. And um, one of the things we, we make sure our, our physicians know is nobody on that executive team is going to step in and say, you must prescribe this drug. Um, so we, we've had a very, um, uh, one of our performance improvement activities over the last, I guess, six or seven years has been to decrease the prescription um, the prescribing practices of benzodiazepines. Uh, we know we're in an area that's really high risk for substance abuse. There's a lot of prescription drug abuse and benzodiazepines are one of the, the biggest um, uh, classifications of drugs that can be abused. So it's not that we don't prescribe them, but if somebody has a, has a history or um, is using substance abuse, we don't prescribe benzodiazepines. If somebody is on what would be considered a high dose benzo for a long period of time, those folks are staffed and we come up with a plan to start decreasing on a, on a gradual basis. So it doesn't make us very popular with some folks who want to come in and be on those drugs, um, but that's where we are. Um, and we have some folks working, I think, with your folks on some of those task, those drug task force forces. Our local state community involvement, we can't, we cannot operate in isolation. We have to have partners and we have to um, be responsive to the community that we serve. So here are some of our partners. We provide um, at no, at no cost, it's just something that we do. Uh, we, we're on most of the health councils um, in the area. I think we have representation on just about all of them. I chair the Greene County Health Council and I'm a member of the Regional Health Council. Um, we have uh, staff on every child abuse review team in every county. Uh, we have staff on the child uh, fatality review teams. Uh, we have staff on the interagency um, councils in every community. Uh, we work with NAMI, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, quite a bit. Um, we, are, we have uh, actually, we've chaired the Regional Planning Committee, which sets the priorities for how mental health dollars will be spent from the state in our region. Um, so we participate both on that regionally and at the statewide level. Um, TAMHO, the Tennessee Association of Mental Health Organizations, is um, our state um, organization and from that we have, we have participation, heavy participation on that actually. Our executive director is currently the, the president of that organization. So we try to make sure that we have a broad um, focus in, ter in terms of our community involvement. Uh, community, regional, and, and statewide. Uh, some support groups that we're involved in. Um, 
education and training. Remember I said one of our key success factors is that we have um, uh, qualified staff, recruitment and retention of staff. Uh, we, we work with the Quillen College of Medicine and we support um, a resident line. Uh, we have, uh, we are an APA training site. Watch for our trainings. We do about five or six APA certified trainings um, a year. Uh, we are an APIC training site for um, psychologists. We right now have four PhD students uh, working with us um, from all over, plus we also support uh, one or two um, psychology students in, at ETSU. Uh, interdisciplinary placement sites for more than a dozen colleges and universities, um, and we have, we have provided funding and support for the Masters of Social Work program. What I'd like for us to do is start being a training site for um, public health students and looking for those opportunities because of one of our big challenges that we're going to talk about in a minute in terms of integrated care, I think we could be a natural site um, to work with some students. What are our challenges? Um, our access and follow-up. We, we are contractually obligated to have very um, very quick access times for people. We have contractual obligations to get people in from the psychiatric hospital to see a doctor within 14 days, to see a mental health professional within 10 days. Uh, we have those standards to meet. And then we have standards for access once a need is identified to get them in quickly. We have modified our initial appointment access. Um, again, it's something that is not very pretty, but it works. We have an open access system, so if you want to get mental health services today, you can call up one of the clinics, and they'll say they'll get some basic information about you over the phone. Um, and if uh, if you have private insurance, then they have to make sure that they can find somebody on the panel to see you and get prior approval for that. So it's a little bit more cumbersome if you have private insurance. But if you don't have private insurance, you can come back, call back the next day, and get an appointment for that day. Um, so we try to get people in within two to three days of their call. It does require them to call back, which is the part people aren't crazy about, but it also lets them know any day you want to come in, if you call between 8 and 8.30, we'll give you an appointment for that day. We're constantly um, looking at evidence-based interventions and making sure that our staff are trained in them. We've done some collaboratives with Milligan College and with ETSU on developing some strands of, of uh, some pockets of excellence within our organization. Uh, we, we most recently um, have done a, a training collaborative on evidence on um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, which is an intervention that we use with, with children who have been uh, traumatized, whatever the trauma is. Kind of started out as dealing with kids who'd go, undergone sexual or physical abuse, but there's all kinds of trauma. And um, it, it's a really good, uh, the therapists love it. Um, the people make progress, uh, and it's been a really good intervention. But we're constantly looking at those kinds of interventions um, and making sure that our staff are trained. Electronic records. Uh, we've had electronic medical record for about 15 years. Um, we are changing vendors, which has got everybody in a, in a wad because it will be a huge transition for us. But um, we have really, if you, if you think about how, how widespread we are, and the people in our region are pretty mobile. Um, anybody can access. If you have somebody who's been in treatment in one area and they move to another area, they don't have to go through that intake all over again. It's very seamless. You have access to their medical record. The crisis staff can pull up somebody to see if, if they're in crisis and they're doing the evaluation. They can go into the record and see if they're in outpatient services, what medications they're on. So using that um, electronic medical record has helped us to really streamline some, some services and, and make it more seamless for the folks that we serve. Um, Y'all know about meaningful use? You heard about meaningful use? Okay. We're involved in the meaningful use initiative, which is kind of a piggyback on the electronic record. The meaningful use initiative is about not just having an electronic medical record, but how you use that record in a meaningful way. Um, and this is really where we start to see. It's funny how these three things and then gone down kind of trickle into each other because um, 
because we're doing meaningful use and trying to do all these outcome measures with meaningful use and these core measures, that will help us get ready for integrated care. Um, integrated behavioral health and primary care is huge right now. Um, trying Because you can't just treat a person in isolation because health is all three of those things that's on the wall. And what we know about, about the population that we serve, individuals with severe and persistent mental illness are dying 25 years earlier than people who do not have mental illness. And that's an alarming statistic. Um, is it because they tend to have very poor, poor health habits? Partly. Is it because they don't go to the doctors and get preventive care? partly? Is it because they're on psychotropic medications that, that create difficulties with diabetes and weight problems and all those other things? Yeah, it's all those things. Um, and so we know that we, we cannot afford to continue to do a good job with the people we serve if we don't start paying attention to their health needs. So we are currently looking at every grant opportunity there is to integrate primary care with behavioral health care. This whole notion of health homes uh, and affordable care organizations, nobody really knows where it's going to fit in. Um, nobody's really talked much about where behavioral health is going to fit in. But it has to fit in. These people, I mean, if you look at it just from a cost situation, they're, they're, they're high dollar individuals. But more than that, they're high risk health individuals. And we have to help them get healthier and help identify those issues and get them the services they need. What we do know about the population that we serve is they tend to not they're fairly comfortable with us if they've been with us for a while. They don't really want to go to the doctors. So we're trying to look for ways that we can at least integrate some, be some primary care screening. Uh, and we're doing some of that with our Meaningful Use Initiative, but we have to, we have to go further. And part of that is learning how to use, you, you asked about how do we pay for these things. Part of it is learning how do you bill for those services? And how do you get set up to get reimbursed for those services? And can these people get reimbursed for these services? So we've got some real challenges coming up in the next 10 years. What we've been able to accomplish in the last 50 years is great and wonderful, but it is not going to sustain us if we don't get on board with, with, these, with these challenges and innovations that are coming up. So that's what we're kind of looking at right now. That's what we're faced with. And um, I think that that will open up some doors for some career opportunities for public health students. Questions? How'd I do on my time? Okay. <laughs> Questions? Comments? So, so I guess I just follow up on what you just you know, mentioned, uh, Julissa. So how, what do you see those career opportunities might look like? Yeah. How do a public health graduate okay. you know, may have in you know, behavioral health right. integrated? Uh, one, of, one of the things that, that we are doing, I think we've used one public health student. Uh, Ginger was talking about that when we met. One of our grants that we got was a wellness coach grant. The Department of, of Mental Health Services wanted us to start, we have had peer support centers for a long time, and they used to be called drop-in centers, which was a place where individuals who had severe and persistent mental illness, who didn't really have uh, much of a, a recreational life or social life, really didn't have much socialization, they could come there and socialize and learn how to recreate. Because a lot of these folks don't know how to recreate appropriately. So they started out as just drop-in centers, just come by and we'll recreate together. And then they moved more towards, yeah, maybe not so much that. Let's help them learn how to deal with recovery and how to be more involved in their own recovery. So now there's this huge focus on let's help them, because of this alarming statistic with regards to their health care needs, uh, let's help them learn how to be more more healthy. Let's approach this from a wellness activity. Let's get a wellness coach in here. Let's teach them some information about their health. And I believe we hired a public health student um, to, to be that wellness coach and to do those kinds of things. I think we will never, I know there are some mental health organizations that actually have um, um, primary care clinics 
within their within their site. I'm not sure we'll ever have the space to do that. I know we don't have the space to do that right now. But I think there's a lot of different ways that you can integrate care. And I think if you get some people on staff who can who can teach about health, who can help people develop uh, intervention strategies, and can be there to kind of coach them and get back in touch with them. The wellness strategies we use at our own office for our own employees are like that. We contract with, with Wellmont for health coaches, for folks who have diabetes and for folks who ha, um, are trying to, to manage their weight. And what we learned about that is that works. If you educate, help people come up with strategies, and then follow along and, and work with them on that. Doing, di doing testing, uh, doing your, you're doing blood work in there that particularly looks at the diabetes scores, um, doing cardiovascular screenings. I think we can do some screenings in our office without setting up full-blown exam tables and having physicians there. And I, I have to think that there's a, there's a venue here where we can work together. Ideas, thoughts? Mm -hmm. yeah, I've heard some, uh, I don't know if there's any empirical evidence behind it, but suggestions that sometimes substance abuse is secondary to some kind of mental health issue. Yeah. How do you all, I mean, that's something that is, that's, do you see? How we, do you that? Yeah, that's a good question. We see both. We see um, oftentimes what happens, how substance abuse develops with individuals who have a mental illness is um, sometimes the only way they can um, feel more normal is to self-medicate. And so they turn to substances to self-medicate, whether it's alcohol or other, or other drugs. Um, and then through that self-medication process, it, it, is, it, it doesn't take long to get into a, a situation where they're abusing substances. And sometimes people come to us for their substance <laughs> abuse problem. And what we find out is there's an underlying significant mental health disorder, whether it's an obsessive compulsive disorder or, uh, or latent schizophrenia or, or uh, bipolar disorder, that, that, that they have been trying to self-medicate um, because of their mental health disorder. And at that point, you really have to treat both. Um, then other times we have individuals who are primarily have a substance abuse disorder, but with it comes the depression, comes the other things. And you know, I talked to you about the fact that we're a co-occurring and provider. So what's important for us is to look at, at the full person look at everything and treat everything that's there. One of the early uh, philosophies about drug treatment was get people off of all drugs, no medication whatsoever. And we found people who had co-occurring disorders did terribly in those programs because they really did need their drugs for their thought disorder. I mean, you, you could, they couldn't come off those drugs. So, I, I, you know, everything's evolution and you learn from the mistakes that you make in your field, but I think that's why there's so much focus now on treating co-occurring disorders and looking to make sure that there's not an underlying other disorder. Other questions? Uh, you, you mentioned your case managers, mm -hmm. I think you, you, you called them, and, and you said that those are individuals who um, work in the community, they're typically bachelors prepared mm -hmm. in one or more fields in the human service. Right. And one of the things that I'm looking to do actually have had some conversations with one of our behavioral health organizations is we're doing um, one of the things we're doing with with one of our managed care organizations right now is helping them with their heat gaps y'all know about heat gaps and um, our folks tend to have tons of heat gaps and um, what they found is the traditional case management the phone case management of calling people and saying hey you got to go get your screening you got to go get your mammogram you got to go get your well adolescence doesn't work very well so what they're looking to do is use our relationship that our case managers have with their clients to help the case managers get that person to the doctor and what I see evolving is we do better in that in that pilot and I've already talked to him about the possibility of how about health care case managers. We use the same model we're using with mental health case managers but we have public health case managers who are working with you know a caseload of 30 to 40 people doing home visits you know, focusing on their health because we have we have this this line we have to be really careful of uh, with our mental health case managers. We don't want them stepping on their doctor's toes, and we we develop this letter in our electronic record, this automatic letter that says we've encouraged 
our mutual client to, to schedule an appointment with you. This appointment is specifically to address the following HEDIS gap because we can't be sure that our folks are going to get to the doctor and the doctor hasn't seen them in two years. And he says, what can I do for you today? And she says, I don't know. My case manager told me to come. So we wanted to make sure that after finally getting them to the doctor, everybody knew what they were there for. Um, so, you know, the, the whole medical issue with our case managers is kind of tricky. But, but think of what we could accomplish in terms of the health and the well-being for these mental health patients if we had somebody from public health who was doing the case management aspect or teaming with the mental health case manager and doing that. So that's, you know, if I had all sorts of funds, that's what I would design. I would design a way to do that. And I don't know that I need a whole bunch of funds. I may just need a CPT code or a HixPix code and a, and a, and a fund. So, my next question, do, do these, uh, the uh, mental health case managers are able to build? Yes. So that's kind of the barrier having public health too. We're licensed as a mental health organization. But how do we build the primary care services? I know it can be done. Um, I just have to clear some of the clutter away and sit down with people who can help me figure out how to do that. Will it require a different license? Heavens knows we're used to being licensed by everybody, so I, you know we could get licensed by somebody else and do it. But I just have to figure out how to do that. And I think it can be done. And for an organization like ours, that to me seems to be the way to integrate care, is to maybe provide, uh, to, to provide ways to reduce those barriers. You said you didn't pursue research. Mm -hmm. Was there, was there a reason? Not that it seems like there's a pool of research. I don't know. In the, you know yeah. the university <laughs> does. The university, your university does think we're a pool of research. And we have often been approached by, by many folks wanting to use our folks for research. Um, you know, every organization does things really well. We just don't do research well. Will we allow research to be done? Yes, we will. Um, we have had, um, uh, Dr. Moore has um, uh, approached us on numerous cases. To, to, to do research and we will make that available to our clients but one of the things we can't do we can't do placebos with our folks we can't do and we won't uh, we won't do uh, it's difficult for us to do blinded studies because we can't very well take somebody off their psychotropic medication to let them you know be on a placebo and to, to try something and not know. We also can't treat somebody not knowing what they're on. So there's some things that, that um, because of what we do, keep us from being able to, to do those kinds of research. But we often, our own students, we have, we have uh, staff who go back and get their master's degree or whatever, and, and they will do um, you know, uh, less intensive research with us. They'll do chart reviews. They'll do, one of our nurse practitioners went back and got her doctorate, and she used uh, a sample of, of folks, not her folks, but you know, that was the only provision we made, is they have to be somebody else's patients, to look at, um, she did a survey with them about their, um, their weight gain under these medications and if that created situations for them where they stopped taking medication. And so, so she did some survey information with them about different different um, types of medication. And we can do that. But we just, um, it's, it's treatment first for us. I mean, we're, we're a treating agency, so uh, well, we have. I was really thinking more on the lines of behavioral therapies like children with autism and yeah. therapies that are coming out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, we, we will, um, as I said, we do these training collaboratives where we will go and we'll get a, if, if an evidence-based practice comes out that we think we should be doing, we'll set up a cluster. We'll start with a small group of people to go and get trained and to, to work in that collaborative. It's very time intensive um, to do something that's evidence-based and stay true to the models, keep the fidelity of the model, and we will measure the fidelity. What we'll do is we'll start with a cluster and then after those people are trained, each one of those people has to train five people and then we try to grow it that way. But um, funny thing about payers, they say they want evidence-based practices, but they don't reimburse any differently for evidence-based practices than they do for non-evidence-based practices. And it really, it's very time intensive to stick to the fidelity of a model in an evidence-based based practice. Uh, a lot of times the other thing that happens to us, and Doug Varney taught me this a long time ago, um, Oftentimes we will train people in, in procedures and what do you think happens after they get trained? 
<laughs> they leave, they open up their, they put their shingle out and they open up their door. And, and, and uh, I used to really, it's not a good reason to not train. You know, just you know, it's just not a good reason to not train. And what Doug used to tell me as I was, because I used to be over our clinical programs in, in Tennessee. My evolution was: I started as a therapist, then became a supervisor at Nolichucky. I was the associate executive director at Nolichucky. Then we merged. Then I was vice president of children's services. Then after a few years, I was a vice president of Tennessee services, and now I'm operations person. But when I was over all the Tennessee services, I just hated to lose these really top-notch people who I just invested invested all this time and money in training, but Doug said to me, that's okay, because part of our mission is to make sure that there's quality behavioral health services in our region, whether we're providing it or somebody else is providing it. So if part of our mission is to train, then that's part of our mission. And just uh, to, to wrap up, uh, Dr. Kidd, would mm -hmm. like to mention that, you know, we, we have an MOU with you guys. Yes. Your interest in having student yes. interns and some of the opportunities that yeah. may be available down there. We do have a memorandum of, of understanding. We have a clinical affiliation agreement with the university and it does include this department. And um, my job will be to find opportunities for you all. Your job is to say, hey, I think I'd like to do something there. Let your professors know and we'll see if we can work something out. Even if it's a shadowing, even if it's just to come and see what this looks like. But um, we, I think our management team um, met with, with, the, with this management team and we brainstormed and we walked away from that meeting going, yeah, we want to get to know each other better. Okay, well, I guess we will wrap up, you know, this morning. Uh, I, again, want to sincerely thank, you know, Dr. You know, Kidd, who joined us on a pretty short notice. Uh, we, we had some scheduling, you know, issues with the, with the September uh, breakfast with the expert, and, and she really, you know, ha helped us uh, out. And, it's my and, and pleasure. This, this happened, you know, very, very quickly, and, and just, again, uh, demonstrates, you know, how effective, you know, she is, and how, you know, committed, uh, Frontier Health is to working with our college and with our students. So we, we thank oh. you and we hope you accept this oh, thank uh, you so much. appreciation certificate and this is well, small thank you. Uh, token thank of you very our much. appreciation. And, uh, thank you. And I do have some flyers. I bought some flyers. Okay. So we'll, we'll pass those uh, flyers <laughs> around. And um, so because of